Yeah. <laughs> the number of churches that I've been a member of in my lifetime is 13, though only two of them were consensual. <laughs> two, um, I joined by accident. Three, I was actually paid to attend, and the rest I was signed up by my parents. Now, some of them were weird. A couple of them involved um, casting out demons and speaking in tongues, which is like Jesus-based psychic exorcism stuff. One of those was a missionary church in Trinidad where the demons we were casting out were actually really cool voodoo spirits who had every right to be there. <laughs> I, I'm still sorry about that. Some of them were cults. It's gonna happen. Um, one of those started as a job interview, which turned out to be a pyramid scheme that was being sued by the Church of Scientology for plagiarism. I actually should have caught on to that one when the onboarding materials all had aliens on them. But I grew up with those Sunday school books where blonde Jesus never gets his sandals dirty, so aliens weren't really a stretch. Okay, except for the off-brand Scientology, all of the churches were Christian. Um, but I don't mean to imply that they followed the teachings of Jesus. I mean, I mean Christian as a brand, right? It's like, it's like ordering a Coke down south. You say, you want a Coke? They say, what kind? You say, Dr. Pepper. It's all Coke. <laughs> but like, but none of it is Coke. Like, not even Coke is Coke. They took the good stuff out of that a long time ago. And the same with Christianity. A lot of churches, you know, got rid of the namesake, kept the name. I don't know about you, the day that I found out that, that Coca-Cola used to have cocaine in it, do you remember that? <laughs> the day I found out, all I wanted was a real Coke. <laughs> all I wanted was a, I was in third grade, I didn't know what cocaine was. I just knew it was probably good if they had to get rid of it. <laughs> same for church. I knew something was missing, and I knew it was probably the good part. <laughs> Let me tell you why. The first church that I was a member of when I was a tiny little girl, um, I actually lived at because my daddy was the preacher and also because it was a lockdown compound in the woods. <laughs> it wasn't a cult, though. That one was um, a state-sponsored Christian alternative to juvenile detention for felon teenage boys. <laughs> It was like a big dormitory and a little chapel for like 12 or 20 violent offenders who had gotten in so much trouble no one wanted to have anything to do with them. No one except my dad, bless his heart. Um, but it was like a second chance place for the kind of boys who were gonna need a third. <laughs> <laughs> I myself gave one of them his fourth and fifth chance against my will, uh, which should tell you all you need to know about how I'm doing. But what happened at the, don't be sad, don't be sad, it's okay. What happened at the boys' home, um, it did kind of like make me who I am, which is a crazy person who <laughs> loves church. I do, y'all, I love church. I, you're surprised because I'm so cool, I know. But I love church. I love to sit in a beautiful room and hear words spoken with great intention. Words that like make sense out of things. Because for everyone who grew up in a Christian prison for children, so many things don't make sense. Church was a place where you could go and be transported out of this world and like into the world of metaphors and symbols and stories. Just a way better world than this one. But also like, is this one. Like this one. Like look at this. This architecture, the art, the community, the Holy Sacrament down over there table. <laughs> this is it. This is pure holiness to me. The only thing that could make this better is uniforms and diarrhea, which is where we're headed, so hold on. <laughs> so, we didn't stay at the boys' home long, not because it was terrible. I mean, it was terrible. It's not why we left. It should have been. Um, we left because my daddy, the preacher, got called to another ministry. Her name was Pam. So... <laughs> My, my mom then married a Southern Baptist and then things got really stupid. Now, here's the deal. The only requirement for leading a church in the Southern Baptist Convention is to be a human man. Um, you, do not, you do not have to go to seminary. You do not know how, have to know how to read. 
You only need to be a man who feels called to lead a church, which is why a lot of churches down south, not all of them, but a lot of them, are absolutely up to the tits with bullshit. <laughs> so the Southern Baptists were not delivering on my need for like meaning and depth. So um, my big act of rebellion at age 17 was to join the Presbyterian Church. <laughs> now look, the Presbyterians were cool intellectuals who drank real wine, they ordained lady ministers, they used all the pronouns for God, they were very advanced, but they also believed in something called predestination, which in a nutshell, it means that God had already decided all of the things in the whole world beforehand, which is an extremely difficult concept for anyone who's been through some shit. And I loved it. I loved it so much. I would go to church every Sunday, and I would hear that God was in charge of everything, and I would cry my eyes out. I was so happy and confused. I would just cry and cry and cry. I was so into this idea. I was so into it that I was actually asked to leave that church. <laughs> I, I did not even know that you could get fired from church. But I did. I was asked to leave that church. The minister, he called me to his office, and he gave me the name of a therapist. And he told me that he thought I was using Jesus for something Jesus isn't for. <laughs> and I said, I'm pretty sure we're all doing that. <laughs> so in my search for the real Coke, the Presbyterian disappointment was like my Pepsi okay moment, right? <laughs> and like, Pepsi was not okay, which is how I ended up in yet another compound in the woods, this time in a Brazilian forest, <laughs> with like a couple of other dozen very freshly uniformed people um, in a highly church-like situation where we've all just shared a cauldron of exceptionally powerful tea. Now, <laughs> some would call this tea hallucinogenic, but we don't use that word because the tea doesn't make you see things that are not there. The tea invites you to see things as they are. <laughs> so, <laughs> Look, this wasn't as a sacred memory to me, so much so that I had to ask God for permission to tell it funny, and um, <laughs> was told rather plainly that taking things too lightly has never been my problem. <laughs> so for anyone who's having a hard time catching up, I went from like Baptist grape juice to sacramental wine to DMT. <laughs> what the tea does is beautiful and natural, and it causes one to feel an overwhelming sense of oneness with all of nature. Think about the most amazing nature thing you've ever seen, like migrations or transformations, incredible intelligence, like real net geo shit, right? Like big, beautiful, and imagine feeling like that thing is you. Not that you're related to it or connected to it, but that thing is your body. This is how I'm feeling, okay. The other thing the tea does is like totally empty my guts. <laughs> now. Some people empty up, I empty down. You know what I'm talking about, don't make me say it. <laughs> it's, look, let's be civilized. The body's a holy place. And so is the forest, which is why we're there. Now the forest, it's an interesting situation. There's like a pavilion, it's a formal service. It's a pavilion, there's leaders in the front, they're doing some chanting and teaching and whatnot. And then there's a lot of chairs where everyone is sitting in their uniforms trying to be cool. And I'm like in the back with my translator, Maria, who's the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life, even before I drank the tea. And she is, she's there. I'm the only person that doesn't speak Portuguese. She's also the only person who speaks English. Uh, this is not a tourist situation. I have actually joined a Brazilian church over Facebook Messenger using Google Translate, flown to Brazil. <laughs> and I've like moved in with a family I've never met to begin a new life, okay? <laughs> Can't say I didn't try. So Maria's there to like help me follow along with the service and to try to answer my questions, which is hard for her because she drank the same tea I did. And I have a lot of questions. I wanna know what is love and what is harm and like is God actually in charge of things and like why didn't my parents protect me and were those boys evil or just broken children and like I'm like going crazy with all the things that I need to know. And she cannot do this for me, but also she can't do this for me because it's like time to make my way to the rest area. Now the rest area is like a, like a shack of toilets like out a little bit, a walk away. And we've got a, walking is a little difficult under the circumstances. 
it's difficult to explain, but you know, Maria's kind of helping me go, and as we go, the ground is moving. You know, it's like, like waving around, and, and the trees are speaking, and the, I can see the wind like making fractals in the air, the shapes. There's a full moon, just like there is tonight. And it's the biggest, brightest one. It's so bright, it is casting sharp shadows that I can hear. <laughs> Having a synesthesia experience. Now that romance dies a little bit in the toilet shack with all the fluorescent lights, but also there's nothing really alive in there. It's like, you know, porcelain and tile or whatever. It's just a row of toilets that are separated by some like strips of shower curtain. And I, and I pull one back and I see a single ant on the toilet seat. It's a, it's a fat one, like black and shiny. And I am overwhelmed with love for this ant because I am him and he is me. <laughs> and we're both Maria and the trees and the wind and the moon. And I realize in this moment that I contain trillions of tiny life forms and that I am but one tiny form inside of the body of many other larger life forms and that everything I've ever known is actually just a nesting doll of universes that are stacked on top of one another. And that in this universe that I share with him, I am a god, <laughs> and I am about to be an Old Testament plagues and pestilence god <laughs> to the same. <laughs> but I want to be a New Testament loaves and fishes god. You know? I want to be like pure love, original Coke Jesus to this ant. And so I reach down and I try to pick him up and move him from the seat. And he runs inside the toilet. And I know then that my power as a deity is limited. There's nothing I can do. You try to help some people. <laughs> and he's never going to understand the weight of my responsibility. <laughs> like what it is that I have to take care of in that moment. And as I pull down my yoga pants <laughs> in the light of the moon, I, I realize that he and I are about to share the full moon experience. <laughs> and I lean down to him and I say to him, as sincerely as I have ever wished or prayed anything for anyone, I say, good luck to you. <laughs> and then I dropped my entire life's work on this tiny creature who had never had a chance against it. <laughs> and I understood suddenly that no one ever meant to hurt me. Some of them tried to help me. It wasn't part of God's plan. I wasn't chosen to carry this burden. I was just an ant in God's toilet looking up at the brightest full moon as my tiny brother had just done. When I finally received the deepest truth that shit happens. <laughs> Karen Faith, everyone.